At 25 years old, Danny Granger was the face of the Indiana Pacers and a burgeoning star who could match up against any of the other elite forwards in the NBA at the time. Statistically, he didn't ascend to the levels of LeBron James and Kobe Bryant, but he had a skill set that his peers had no choice but to respect. And if they didn't, they ran the risk of getting a 30-piece dropped on their head. Granger hit his peak during the 2008-2009 season when he posted the best numbers of his career while also leaving it a little bit of potential left in the tank. Just a few years later though, injuries forced him into an early retirement. The one-time All-Star became riddled with lower body injuries that made it virtually impossible for him to bounce back and be his former self. And unfortunately, it was yet another story we've seen one too many times before a promising young young star brought down by things out of his control back in 2005 the indiana pacers selected denny granger 17th overall however as you might expect his basketball journey begins well before that born in metairie louisiana on april 20th 1983 denny granger grew up around two things drugs and violence both of which were mentioned by espn's chris broussard when he wrote up a feature on Granger back in 2009. Broussard also noted that Granger had several of his friends wind up in prison. Not only that, he mentioned how Granger's mother deserted the family when Granger was just 12 years old, leaving his father to care for three kids by himself. I can't even begin to imagine the type of mental, physical, and emotional stress that Danny Granger dealt with during these years. But he managed to harness all of that energy and turn himself into the epitome of a scholar athlete. During his senior year at Grace King High School in Louisiana, Granger averaged 20 point, 24 points, pardon me, 24 points, 12 rebounds, and five and a half blocks while on the basketball team. But in the classroom, he was arguably better. He went on to graduate in the top 10% of his class and also scored a 30 out of 36 on his ACT a score that was nine points higher than the national average for his graduating class. Granger was so brilliant and such a well-rounded student that he applied to and got accepted into Yale University. However, the desire to play college basketball consumed Danny Granger, and he ultimately wound up attending Bradley University, which was, believe it or not, the only school that had offered him a basketball scholarship. Bradley, located in Peoria, Illinois, is a, you know, a smaller university that is not known for their athletics. So Granger, who was supremely talented, accepted his scholarship, goes off to Illinois and immediately makes an impact as a freshman. During that season, the six foot eight forward stuffed the stat sheet as densely as he could. In just about 24 minutes, Granger finished with averages of 11 points and seven rebounds and was also showing flashes of being quite the disruptive defender. In 29 games, Granger would accumulate 70 blocks and 37 steals. However, Bradley lacked the collective talent to be competitive and finished with a paltry nine and 20 record. During the subsequent season, Granger made immense improvements as a scorer and averaged upwards of 19 points for that season, a mark that would have led the Missouri Valley Conference if Granger had qualified for the leaderboard. Unfortunately, that season deteriorated faster than a piece of cotton candy getting dropped into a glass of water. After that freshman season, Bradley had fired their current head coach at the time, Jim Molinari, yep, Jim Molinari, and had brought in someone new, of course, a gentleman by the name of Jim Less. And I think it's safe to say that Jim and Granger did not see eye to eye, and that was apparent almost immediately. Les had coached professionally previously, both with the Omaha Racers and the Sacramento Monarchs, the latter of which being a former WNBA team, but signing on with Bradley was his first NCAA coaching gig. And I don't know what transpired, but again, Bradley and Granger did not have the greatest start to their relationship. Multiple reports stated that Les and Granger 
had beef and this wasn't any low quality beef either they had filet mignon type issues ultimately granger had immense resentment toward his head coach and would wind up transferring to new mexico but the process was not as smooth as it seems granger initiated his transfer after quote getting fed up with the intimidating tactics of his head coach granger explained how les had verbally abused him on multiple occasions following losses that Bradley had suffered, saying, quote, I saw a side of Coach Les I had not seen. I felt I couldn't trust the man and he intimidated me. It was difficult to play through all of that. As if Bradley University didn't look bad enough, during all of this, their athletic director at the time decided to pile on the bad press by accusing New Mexico of coaxing Danny Granger into transferring there despite him being enrolled at Bradley, which would have been a violation of NCAA rules. Perhaps I'm just crazy, but looking back on it, it seemed that Bradley did not have Granger's best intentions at heart. They appeared to be siding with their newly signed head coach and not the all-conference level player who made the basketball program exciting. And I feel that's more evident by them not only refusing to grant his release of a scholarship, but also rejecting the appeal that he filed following that original rejection. At any rate, Granger eventually made his way over to New Mexico and didn't miss a beat. He just continued to put up numbers despite all of the shit that had gone on beforehand. He made his debut about halfway through the season because of the NCAA's ridiculous transfer rules but for the second half of the season he averaged close to 20 points a night and did so while shooting about 49 percent from the field furthermore he maintained his ability to be both an effective shot blocker and a disruptor in the passing lanes retrospectively leaving bradley might have been the best decision that granger could have made as an nba prospect yes he was going to new mexico which was still a mid-major however they were a higher tier and they played against stiffer more rigorous competition and it also gave granger a little bit more exposure put more eyes on him well that's not necessarily a good thing always it can be there are more people who are watching you put your talents on display but it also means that there are more people watching you and any mistakes any deficiencies any inadequacies will be magnified it, it's a pessimistic way of looking at it but I can only use that type of verbiage because it didn't apply to Danny Granger as a senior. He went out and absolutely crushed it. Granger began that season with 18 points against North Carolina A&T, and he cracked double digits in every contest that season, ultimately finishing with a scoring average of 18.8 points. It was a slight dip compared to the previous year, but that notwithstanding, Danny Granger went on to be not only one of the most efficient players in the conference, but one of the most efficient players in the country. His true shooting percentage, a metric that takes into account made twos, threes, and free throws, was 63.4%. That season, the NCAA leader was Salim Stoudemire at 68.9%. And as if Granger's scoring wasn't spectacular enough, he again proved he had potential to be an impactful defender combining for 4.1 steals and blocks per game that season on granger's shoulders new mexico had one of the best seasons in school history finishing with a 26 and 7 record they beat utah in the conference title game to secure a berth in the ncaa tournament but unfortunately any potential cinderella run was ended in the first round when they lost to villanova with four years of college ball under his belt, it was clear that, at the worst, Danny Granger had the potential to be a high-level role player in the NBA. His talent was undeniable, and he deservedly landed in the first round of many mock drafts. And the icing on the cake was his talent being inside of a six-foot-eight, highly athletic frame. However, there were some GMs and people across the league office who had doubts about Granger's ability to succeed at the next level. One of the main highlights of Danny Granger's collegiate resume was him being good at a lot of things. Paradoxically, it was also the worst thing about him because he didn't succeed at one thing. He wasn't, you know, a super 
talented scorer. He wasn't an exceptional defender, not an outstanding playmaker. He didn't have any of that. And unfortunately, the versatile forwards that are a hot commodity today were not as popular back then. Even so, he did have the potential to be a go-to scorer and teams could bring him in for individual workouts just to see what he was working with and what his repertoire looked like. As I mentioned at the top of the video, Granger landed in the Pacers lap, the middle portion of the first round just outside the lottery in what has gone on to be one of the more forgettable classes in recent memory. However, any redraft, even with his short career, Danny Granger is easily landing anywhere between the second and the fifth pick. Of course, with the first overall pick being reserved for Chris Paul. Granger joined a Pacers team that had some decent pieces. Jermaine O'Neal and Steven Jackson occupied most of the leadership responsibilities, and that became even more prevalent after the Pacers traded Meta World Peace to Sacramento for Peja Stojakovic. Even with all of that firepower, head coach Rick Carlisle wasted no time putting Danny Granger into his rotation, and the rookie posted some respectable numbers. He averaged about seven points and four rebounds in a little less than 23 minutes. Despite all of the talent on paper, the Pacers finished with a 41 and 41 record. They qualified for the playoffs, but wound up getting beat by the New Jersey Nets. That summer, Stoyakovich got shipped from the bustling metropolis that was Indianapolis down to the Bayou. In return, the Indiana Pacers got David Anderson, Marcus Banks, and Jared Jack. Talent void left by the Croatian swingman meant that Danny Granger had to step up and occupy an even more prominent role, one that helped expedite his development. While Granger didn't set the league on fire, he wound up nearly doubling his scoring average, finishing just shy of 14 points per night. Throughout the season, Granger emerged as the Pacers' most efficacious floor spacer, finishing with a team-high 110 made threes and shooting at about 40%. Now, by this point, Danny Granger was an integral piece of the Pacers rotation. He appeared in all 82 games and started 57, and consistently, he was up around 32, 33, 36 minutes per night. And for the season as a whole, he finished just shy of 2,800 minutes played. Now, if Granger continued to improve at this trajectory, he would reach the potential that everybody thought he had. He would be an above average role player. That prediction turned out to be light years away from the truth once Danny Granger got done with his third professional campaign, which was one where he continued to improve at a substantial rate. Whether or not anybody knew it at the time, Danny Granger was the guy in Indianapolis. He again improved considerably as a scorer, attacking on nearly six points to his nightly average, which put him at 19.6. On top of that, he began to receive a bulk of the shots on offense. While all of that undeniably played a role in enhancing Granger's production, he managed to stay just as efficient as a shooter. Overall, Granger buried 44.6% of his shots, which is a very respectable clip. However, as soon as he stepped beyond the three-point line, he mutated into an even more lethal beast, and he would finish with a shooting clip of 40.4% from three, and his volume was among the best in the league. He connected on 171 threes that season, which was the 10th highest amount in the NBA. As you would expect, Danny Granger's metamorphosis led to a sizable payday in the form of $60 million. And while that extension wouldn't kick in until the following season, I don't know if the money motivated him more or motivated him any less than before, but like a level 30 Charmillion, Danny Granger's final form had yet to be realized. About three years before Granger had signed this deal, in the autumn of 2005, Ron Artest, who was still named Ron Artest at the time, wound up making small talk with Danny Granger Sr. in the aftermath of one of Indiana's games early that season. He looked Danny Sr. in his eyes and said, quote, Mr. Granger, in two years, your son is going to be a star. Our test's prediction proved to be 99% correct. The only thing he got wrong was the timeline. Granger kicked off the 2008-2009 season with six straight 20-plus point performances, 
his highlights of that campaign include dropping 42 on the Detroit Pistons and also dropping 42 and 41 on the Golden State Warriors. Additionally, there were also nine instances of him finishing with more than 35 points. In 67 games, Granger averaged 25.8 points, the league's fifth highest total, trailing only Dirk Nowitzki, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, and Dwayne Wade. In the Pacers record books, it is the second highest scoring season since their absorption into the NBA in 1976. While the numbers prove that Granger was one of the league's most voluminous bucket getters, I'm not sure he reaches that point without maximizing his versatility. Granger had an even distribution of made twos, made threes, and made free throws, and was pretty efficient for a volume scorer, shooting about 45% overall, 40% from three, and 88% from the free throw line. Part of Granger's scoring explosion can be traced back to his admittedly strange practice habits. He explained to ESPN's Chris Broussard that part of his practice routine included placing himself in these less than advantageous situations, whether it was receiving a bad pass or being at a weird spot in his jump. He said, quote, I'm telling you, I get at least one unorthodox shot every game. Granger made his first and only All-Star appearance that season, much to the chagrin of people who thought that All-Stars should be good players on winning teams. He also went ahead and won the NBA's Most Improved Player Award, but unfortunately, he wasn't selected to any of the three All-NBA teams. You could argue that he deserved a spot on the third team over either Carmelo Anthony or Pau Gasol, but it comes back to the Pacers' collective mediocrity. While Granger had All-NBA caliber numbers and satisfied the eye test, Pacers had only 36 wins that season, and it's tough to give him the edge when Anthony's Nuggets and Pau's Lakers had won 54 and 65 games, respectively. Weirdly enough, despite Granger putting on an absolute clinic for an entire season, there were still some people who were not sold on him as a franchise player. ESPN's Chris Broussard in this piece that I've already mentioned, I think twice, already got two quotes one from someone with an Eastern Conference team, one from a Western Conference team that effectively downplayed everything Danny Granger did. The first one is from the guy in the East who said, quote, it's not an indictment of him that the Pacers aren't winning, but if he's your best player, which he is in Indiana, you're in trouble. You're not going to win at a high level. Now, the guy who was with the Western Conference team wasn't as cut and dry about it. He said, quote, Granger can be a Scotty to somebody's Mike. He just can't be Mike. And yeah, he was right. He couldn't be Mike. Not many people can be Michael Jordan. However, I feel that these quotes would be able to be taken a bit more seriously if folks acknowledged that the Pacers had a collectively weak team. It felt like every time they took the floor, they were asking Danny Granger to pull an 18 wheeler across the country by himself. During his all-star season, his second leading scorer was Mike Dunleavy, who averaged 15.1 points, but appeared in just 18 games. After him, it was a, revol a revolving door of TJ Ford, Troy Murphy, Marquis Daniels, Dara Jack, all of whom averaged anywhere from like 13 to 14 and a half points. Granger, however, was unfazed by all of the negativity, saying, quote, I'm about 70% of the player I can be. After that career season, Granger returned to an Indiana Pacers team who didn't really get much better over that summer. Still, Granger put together a season comparable to the one previous, averaging about 24 points on a little bit less than 45% shooting. He again finished top 10 in both points per game and made threes, but all of the accolades eluded him. No all-star appearance, no votes for any of the major awards, no all-NBA appearances, none of that. As Granger entered his sixth season in 2010, the Pacers again appeared to be headed for another year of underachieving. Their major acquisitions that offseason were Darren Collison and Paul George. Collison was traded for, and George was whom they selected in the 2010 draft. The problems persisted. Indiana 
just did not have adequate help for Danny Granger. Collison averaged about 13 points a night, and neither Roy Hibbert or Mike Dunleavy provided anything of value. The Pacers, as you might expect, got off to a slow start that season and were 17 and 27 when they fired their head coach, Jim O'Brien. Shortly thereafter, they brought in Frank Vogel to replace him, a move that altered the trajectory of the franchise. Vogel, a first time head coach, led Indiana to a 20 and 18 record during his limited time. They finished 37 and 45, but managed to qualify for a playoff spot. Fortunately, they faced the Chicago Bulls in the first round and yeah, it went about as well as you might expect. Indiana got eliminated quite quickly, but there was some optimism, especially now that they have a seemingly competent head coach. With the lockout shortened 2011-2012 season underway, it was apparent that Vogel just had a more robust understanding of how to maximize the talents of this Pacers team. He wound up leading them to a 42 and 24 record, which placed them at third in the East behind Miami and Chicago. The crazy part is that they made this improvement without the roster getting considerably better. It was more the same. Granger was putting up a decent amount of points. This time he finished with a little bit less than 19 per night, but his teammates were still getting low double digits. However, they committed to playing intense defense with the likes of David West, Roy Herbert, George Hill, and Paul George. That commitment to defense led them to the postseason, of course, where they faced off against Orlando in the first round. They had wrestled the magic wand away from their opponent and eliminated them in five games. Next, they drew a matchup against the LeBron James and Dwayne Wade led Miami Heat. As we know, LeBron James was at a different level in this point in his career and he shredded the Indiana Pacers to the tune of 30 points and 11 rebounds. Dwayne Wade was quite helpful as well, getting about 26 per night, but Indiana was still able to stretch the series to six games and the point differential wasn't as grand as many people would have expected. And the reason for that is, well, Chris Bosh only appeared in one game, but Indiana could have seriously upset the Miami Heat if Danny Granger played better. For whatever reason, he just didn't show up and he finished the series averaging 13 points on 37.7% shooting. I'm sure you guys have noticed, but Danny Granger's play began to drop off after he was selected as an all-star. He was consistently averaging fewer points on less shots with less efficiency, and it's unclear as to why. At the conclusion of the 2011-2012 season, Granger was just 29 years old and still in the middle of his athletic prime. Yeah, he had had some injuries in the past, but there was nothing catastrophic. There was nothing that required surgery. And unfortunately, all of that changed the following campaign. That season, the 2012-2013 season, he didn't debut until February 23rd as he dealt with left knee tendinosis. An article on Medical News Today, which has been medically reviewed by a licensed practitioner, explains that tendinosis occurs when tendons degenerate, meaning that they begin to break down. Sometimes it's misdiagnosed as tendinitis, which is just an inflammation of the tendons as opposed to an actual degeneration of them. In total, Danny Granger suited up for just five games that season and scored 27 total points in those contests. The injury gods were only slightly kinder to Danny Granger the following season. He appeared in just 29 games with the Pacers averaging about eight points and three and a half rebounds. By that point, Paul George had usurped Danny Granger as the face of the franchise, resulting in Indiana trading him to Philadelphia. In return, they got Lavoy Allen and Evan Turner. He was then waived by the Sixers and wound up signing with the Los Angeles Clippers, where it appeared that a little bit of life had been breathed into his career. He averaged eight points in 16 minutes and shot a respectable 35% from three. Unfortunately, nothing came of it, and Danny Granger's last NBA action came with the Miami Heat 
in 2014. He spent 30 games with the team and averaged a little bit more than six points. Several months later, he got traded to the Phoenix Suns. And then several months after that, he got traded to the Detroit Pistons and he didn't suit up for either of those teams, formally announcing his retirement in 2015 at 31 years old. Thank you guys so much for coming to hang out with me on this one. If you could, please like the video and leave a comment. They greatly help in the algorithm. Everything else that I'm associated with will be linked in the description box below, whether it's social medias, the podcast that I do, all that stuff will be there. So please feel free to check it out. And as always, thank you guys. And I'll catch you in the next one.